。哎，陈大。哎，小春。哎，能听得见？听见我声音哈？能听得见。哦哦，好，那行。因为上一次那个不知道为什么老爷老爷连不上，是吧？啊。哎呀 ，Zoom 就是申请的比较困难。嗯。然后那个杜伟奇和那个张灿做通传。哦，还有通传那不错的，挺好。嗯，哎、那个优化优化九月份标高搞一个在韩国搞个会嘛，嗯，然后让让我叫几个人，然后我说一块请请您一块去。可以，可以，可以，可以，可以。啊，这是啊，对，我就说那个八月份咱们那个，就是那个打招呼了吧？叫那个大会啊，要请他来一下，我想啊。八月份，咱八月份那个会是吧？八月二十。对对对。啊。嗯。我具体记不太清什么时候，就我请他来一下吧。啊。对。一开始啊，还就是。我想叫人，叫人军官，军官不行，他们部队出不去。啊，你说那个九月份那个是吧？那可能是对，那就咱们几个，然后他得再叫些，他想想那个多邀请一些那个声，就是多怎么多招了一些那个中国的医生去参与一下。嗯，可以啊，嗯，那就叫什么陈美呀，什么老范呀，这就那就组织大家都脱脱稿呗。对啊，对啊，嗯，可以。什么燕姨有点不太出去。银河饭包，他他应该是专门邀请的，所以他们肯定那个出机票啊、路费啊什么的。然后剩下的就是都是那个投稿呗，发言、演讲去参参与一下。哦，对了，九月份好像那个谁是不是还有一个什么？那个我看看，九月份那个叫什么来？那个他是不是还要组织一个什么什么会？组织一个脊椎损伤修复的会？在哪一天呢？哦，对，你看，他那个他是七月呃九月八九号吧，啊六号到九号的是啊，他是什么时候？优化组是什么时候？呃，时间时间好像定下来了，但我没没我看一下啊，没太注意，九、哦、月几号？不应该是九月二十几号，应该是。九二十几号哈、啊，哦。对，九月我看看哪天，啊，我没记在日常里边，我我到邮件里再找一找。嗯嗯。行，嗯，今天好像不是在同一时间，嗯，那就他们这种会就是把所有人都放到会议室里边，然后大家可以自由讨论啊什么。对对对，对，好像人不是太多，嗯，是吧？原来弄过几个人，不是特别多啊，五六十人，五六十人那样。你看有几次都是十点钟开始，九点到十点开始，真的太晚了。嗯，这到几点晚上？到十点。到十点啊，哦。嗯，不一定，那个有可能早一点。一共四个发言，然后两个病例讨论。哦。行，一会儿啊，我你们开始以后，我让那谁说完了，让谁开始上嘛？开始了以后，剩下你们就讲讲，人家主持一下啊。我一会儿，因为我现在在外边呢，一会儿我开车去啊。嗯，行吧。嗯嗯。哎，没上来那个，嗯，还有五分钟，嗯，还有五分钟，哦啊，等于是病例讨论是哦，那个是呃，关键和那个宛如是一人一个病例讨论哈，是吧？对，嗯，也都是讲到 ACF 技术吗？嗯嗯，行吧，嗯。
，哎，是不是主持是这个谁开始是？是 Sharif 开始是我们直接开始啊？嗯、呃，您和他一块儿吧，主持。不是，那就是他先说是吧？对，因为他第一个发言嘛，哦、所以说您您第一下最开始主持一下好一点吧。好的，好的，好的，没事，好，就他先开始开场是吧？啊，啊。嗯，好吧。Hi, Alton. Nice to meet you. Please open your speaker. Now it's okay. Yeah. How's life? Hello, hello, Professor Adam. Hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to see you, nice to see you. Uh, are, you are you from uh, uh, Moscow? Uh, yes, I'm actually uh, living uh -huh. in Moscow, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Sandeep. Hey, how are you? Thank you, fine. And you? Nice to meet you. All good. Hey, nice to see you, Professor Sandeep. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, yeah. Hey. Uh, I'm Dr. Jian from Beijing. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I've been to many cities in China, but never been to Beijing. Ha 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 ha! Hope next time. I <laughs> hope so. Uh, uh, hope, uh, when you are convenient to be, uh, we can invite you to Beijing. Uh. Testing for our chairman. I think Salman is the first speaker, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the so first speaker. Ah. No, uh, it's a uh, it's on time, <laughs> Professor Sarif. So neither he nor Imad both are not picking up the phone. It, uh, it seems he's, uh, he's not online now. Mm. Yeah. Wait for a minute or let's start now. <laughs> yeah, we just wait for a minute and then we'll start yeah. otherwise. Okay, okay. Let's wait uh, one minute. Oh. Hey, log in karna bhai. Hello. <laughs> Salman, start it. Okay, good. I, I, it wasn't allowing me to um, unmute. I'm sorry, I was giving a lecture in another webinar of uh, ACNS, YNS, just finished it. 
this minute. So oh, I apologize. I apologize please, for joining oh. late. Okay. I was there for the last two hours. I'm very sorry. Okay, so I'm just going to share. Okay, um, my dear friends, uh, uh, Sandeep, can I start? Is that okay? You should start now. It's okay. It's okay. Huh? All right. Thank you. So I think, uh, you know, I'm sorry that I was stuck, but it was uh, a very good uh, webinar with the ACNS people on, um, you know, people from lower middle income countries getting together. Uh, it was a um, good discussion. Anyway. Uh, I'll be talking about cervical spine injuries, acute care, and medical management. This is from the guidelines that the WFNS Spine Committee recently made, and it's published, and everything is available on the website, and you, you can go and even have a look at it, and I'll share the link with you once we are going through it. So who are the patients at risk of having a spinal trauma? All patients have sustained polytrauma, unconscious patients, minor trauma with neck pain, uh, what are the factors that delay diagnosis? Obviously, you've got concomitant uh, head injury. You've got altered state of consciousness, poor radiology, or multiple injuries, and we are not sure what is causing the problems, and all that delays the thing. We know that primary injury is from an initial traumatic force applied to spinal cord. So you could have a bone disc or ligament disc material coming out and putting pressure in the canal on the cord. Um, the secondary injury is the one that we are interested in. We want this uh, not to continue and we need to prevent this. And this is the, it follows primary injury and it includes microcirculation disruption, loss of autoregulation, edema, and ischemia. Initial ma management of obviously can uh, consist of these things. Uh, management on the field, patient need to be immobilized, should be before and during extrication from a vehicle or removal of the helmet also during transport to the hospital. Patients should be transported in a cervical hard collar and side head supports on hard board. So just like that, you've got side head support and a collar with board and with the straps, which are also attached to the um, chest as well as the limbs, because you don't want your neck to be bobbling all over the place. Strapping should be applied to shoulders and pelvis, as well as head to prevent the neck becoming the center of rotation. Log roll, standard maneuver, minimum four people, minimum three or four people. So two people turn, one person holds the neck, makes sure that it's not moving or bobbling. And one person then examines the back once they have turned to see if there is no bumps or tenderness or any kind of um, deformity that you can feel. If you have no neck pain, no neurology, and no other distracting injuries, then obviously it's unlikely that you're gonna be having any kind of spinal cord injury. So in these patients who don't have pain, uh, you, you, know, you don't need to worry about them because you ask them to do rotation, flexion, extension, and they can do that, then you know that there is no fracture. Principles of evaluation depends on the skeletal injury, the neurological injury, the spinal injuries, associated non-spinal injuries, and then treatment priorities according to the problems that we see. Evaluation of the patient, general abrasion. So if you've got an abrasion on the forehead, you know that the type of injury that you have probably got hit on the front of the head. And if that is the case, you know, you can think about uh, those kind of fractures that get, could be because of this flexion injury. And so you palpation, localization for pain, neurological examination, if the cranial nerves are involved, you're thinking about any cranial nerve that is going down into the spine and motor sensory function, and also obviously rectal tone, bulbar cavernous reflex and incontinence. And A, B, C, D, E comes into play as well. So imaging studies, plain x-rays are not recommended anymore unless the CT scan is not available. If the CT scan is available, that is the first line recommended along with surgical reconstruction. If you really have to do plain x-rays, you have to have an AP and lateral in which you should be able to do, see the spinous process of the second and all the way to the first thoracic vertebra. Laterally, you should be able to see the base of the occiput down to C71 junction. And if you can't see that, you will be missing injuries. Odontoid view could be done as well. Indications for Im imaging, we, I've already talked about. The problem with plain x-ray is that you could miss injury in about one third of these patients. 
it can have devastating long-term consequences. So therefore, it should must be pres presumed until it's excluded. And the way to exclude is, is to do a, a high quality CT scan with a sagittal reconstruction. And if you do that, you're going to be picking, picking up all these small minor injuries, osteophytes, um, you know, simple fractures which are there. So the ch chances of you missing something is negligible. MRI is not essential if somebody's got fracture dislocation, severe compression, you can see. Uh, then obviously the first thing to do would be to put in tongs and then reduce if at all possible, if uh, there are no contraindications to it. Um, if not, then if you have time and if you have an MRI machine close by, you can do that. Um, it can further define the level, nature of injury. It can identify the pattern and anatomical level of uh, cord injury. And depending on the prognosis you're going to have, it can identify soft tissue, ligamentous disruption, or disc herniation, uh, presence of hemorrhage, edema, cord swelling, increased degree of spinal cord uh, compression and canal compromise, and the length of the lesion itself that can tell us what kind of prognosis this patient is going to have. So neurological classification, we all know this, complete and incomplete injury. Um, the anterior cord syndrome, central cord syndrome, and brown cicad. Obviously, with the anterior cord syndrome, it is due to hyperreflection injury, hyperflexion injury with disruption of the anterior spinal artery, as you can see here. So you get bilateral loss of motor pain and temperature sensation below the level of injury. And you're going to have intact vibration and proprioception. With the central cord syndrome, that's classically in older people, it's due to hyperextension injury. You get sensory and motor deficits, and you can see why and upper extremities are affected more than the lower extremities. Uh, and bronze saccade, we know, but you know, you've got the best prognosis with central cord syndrome. This is our friend uh, uh, from Germany who was with us in one of our trips onto Naga Parba base camp. There's a picture there. So let's look at the guidelines of cervical spine. Uh, level one evidence that in the awake asymptomatic patient who is without neck pain or tenderness, who has a normal neurology, who is without an injury distracting from an accurate um, evaluation and who is able to complete a functional range of movement, radiology of cervical spine is not recommended. So we know this. And discontinue of immobilization for these patients is recommended without cervical spine imaging. If you have all that and you're certain and there's range of movement is okay, you can remove the immobilization. In the awake symptomatic patient, high quality CT imaging is recommended. If high quality CT is available, uh, not available, then routine three view radiographs could be done. If it's uh, available, then you should do that. So plain x rays are not required. If uh, the radiological evaluation cannot be done because of various reasons, just like obtunded patient, unavailable patient, then obviously in those patients, high quality CT is recommended. Again, plain x rays are not recommended unless uh, we don't have a CT and then. Whenever we get a CT, we should add that um, in our, our momentum. Methylprednisolone, we have given lots of methylprednisolone, and we see it's still about 30% of um, um, surgeons giving methylprednisolone for spinal cord injury. In with Brecken, the, these studies in back in the 80s, in his third study, methylprednisolone failed to demonstrate an effect in comparison to placebo. Additionally, due to increased risk of infection, it's a risk, it's no longer recommended. So the guidelines are the administration of methylprednisolone for treatment of acute spinal cord injury is not recommended. It's not FDA approved. There is no class one or two evidence that it works. There is class one, two, and three evidence that high dose steroids are associated with harmful side effects, including death. There is no good evidence that high dose methylprednisolone administration is beneficial in correlation because of its high risk rate of complications. You can use it, but in selected young patients with acute spinal cord injury, with 24 hour infusion within eight hours injury may be suggested because of somebody who's got C7 sensory uh, motor level, and you can think that if you give steroids, maybe you could improve that by one or two grades. So you, so you say that would it go up to the T1 and your um, finger movement could be improved. So maybe you could give it there. You could give it when your theater is not available for whatever reason. You could give it if there's a contraindication at the time of, uh, of, of um, a surgery proceeding, or you could also give it where you feel that it, because of itrogenic trauma, 
something has happened there and then you can give it then obviously it's beneficial uh, what about the cardiopulmonary management of spinal cord injury this has been going on since 1970s and we have evidence from 70s and 80s that uh, if we bring the map up to 85 or greater for first seven days that improves the outcome dopamine norepinephrine epinephrine are common first line agents uh, there is consensus, uh, there is level 3 evidence that phenylephrine is recommended for inotropic support compared to dopamine in patients above 55 years of age. And this is to avoid reflex bradycardia in these patients. The complications with patients with dopamine above 55 are higher, so phenylephrine is used there. In cervical or high thoracic lesion with both hypotension and bradycardia, a drug like norepinephrine with chronotropic and anotropic effects as well as vasoconstrictor properties must be required, might be required. For low thoracic lesions, um, where hypotension is usually the result of peripheral vasodilation, a pure vasopressor drug such as phenylephrine may be appropriate. The use of dopamine for treating spinal cord injury is limited due to effects on vasodilation, possible risk of reflex bradycardia. Respiratory complications, only 40% of patients with lesion above C4 are successfully extubated. Prediction for need for tracheostomy are HIA lesions, extent of the lesion, smoking, previous lung disease. Early tracheostomy in these patients leads to shorter ICU stay and reduction in time of mechanical ventilation. Uh, management of airway is with video laryngoscopy or fiber optic laryngoscope. In the cannot intubate, cannot ventilate scenario, surgical airway or, or cricothyroidectomy may be performed. Direct laryngoscopy can still uh, cause spinal manipulation during manual inline immobilization. So we need to be careful there and try doing fiber optic or video laryngoscopy. What about the timing of surgery? Uh, there are many studies out there which have clearly shown that operating early, just like if your finger gets stuck in a door, you try to take it out as soon as possible. So there is emerging evidence and consensus among spine surgeons for early decompression. Uh, it could be within eight hours or within 24 hours. At six months post-injury, early surgical decompression was associated with 2.8-fold increase odds of a two Asia grade impairment improvement with no difference in acute complication. So clearly, if you do that at six months follow-up, you see there is a huge advantage in these patients. There is evidence that a surgical decompression and stabilization within six hours of a partial spinal cord injury will lead to 70% of these patients improving by one or more Asia grades. If the surgery is delayed beyond six hours, there is only a 12% chance of improvement. And this is at till and the time of discharge. So this is amazing that, you know, if you can do this, patient can come this early and you can operate early, then you can really give that kind of result as long as you do the other things as well, just like you know, making sure the other injuries are uh, also taken care of. A map is uh, um, taken care of. Uh, so I think many factors play a role on our outcome. I think this is the most important slide of the presentation. So 10 to 15% of individuals with ACIA grade convert to ACIA B to D. So our concept that you've got complete injury, nothing is gonna happen, you will ne never improve is wrong. Uh, we know that one in eight, one in seven patients will improve. The problem is that only 3% of them will have some kind of functional strength going up to Asia D. But rest of them will improve to a certain extent and will do few of the things. So I think we need to push um, for these patients with Asia A and see if we can convert them into some kind of improvement for them. Half of the patients with initial sacral sparing Asia B gain substantial functional strength below the lesion will convert to Asia C and D, and this is again at the time of discharge that we are talking about. 86% of those classified as Asia C and D as 72 hours again, useful motor functions. So I think we know that all this is possible. If you do this surgery early and push these patients, then there's, there may be a chance of improvement in these patients. This is again Ferry Meadows, one of the famous points up in North Pakistan. What are the predictors of outcome? Obviously, Asia grading is important ankle grading could be used. And then we have this um, basic score um, and then comparing it with the Asia grading. So basic score is when you have got uh, a um, 
completely normal MRI, then in those patients, we know patients could present with D and E after spinal cord injury, but at the same time, but majority of them will just move to E. If you've got only gray matter involvement of the injury in it, that contusion is there, then we know majority will be C, D, and E, and all of them will convert to D and E. If you have got a significant amount of gray white matter involvement of the spinal cord, then obviously you start with A, B, C, and you end up in C and D in majority of the cases. With complete involvement of the cord, uh, majority of the patients are going to stay in A and B. If you have got hemorrhage along with the complete involvement of cord, then your chances of improvement are not there. All the patients remain like that static in this study. So this tells us that you know you can predict the outcome in these patients. Uh, so the recommendations from WFNS Spine Committee are uh, given on these uh, websites. So if you go onto wfns-spine.org, and you can, for example, type cervical spondylolic myelopathy, lumbar spinal stenosis, cervical spine trauma, or spinal cord injury, or thoracic lumbar spine fractures or osteoporotic spine fractures then you should be able to get all these papers which are open access there. We are already in the middle of um, publishing on back pain and lumbar disc prolapse along with CV junctions. This, the, these papers should be up and should be there in a few months' time as well. So it's possible for you to access all these papers on all these topics for free uh, from here, which are the recommendations of the spine committee. So for example, cervical spine trauma, early management, upper cervical spine trauma, subaxial uh, cervical spine trauma, all those are available uh, open access. So traumatic central cord syndrome has a good prognosis. All the factors as older age and severe neurology are associated with lower likelihood of neurological recovery. Conservative management, use of hemodynamic support, maintaining MAP to 85 to 90 remains the most useful treatment for central cord. To improve the outcome of central cord, there are signs of instability or continuing compression. Early surgery should be considered. Presence of facet dislocation and CT is suggestive of poor neurology uh, and outcome. MRI T2 sequence, as we just saw, uh, can give us tell us that about that injury and give us those predicting findings, including sagittal grades, length of injury, maximum canal compromise, maximal canal cord compression axial grading as we just saw. And now recently, we are also able to predict this with DTI sequences to predict um, what kind of outcome you're going to have uh, and which patients are going to convert from acute to chronic and which will improve. Uh, decompressive surgery is effective in spinal cord injury and should be performed as soon as possible. Data suggests that better outcomes are correlated with surgery performed within 24 hours. There is no clear evidence that non-operative treatment is better or equivalent to delayed decompression. Pharmacological treatment as an adjunct to spinal cord injury has always been topic of debate. Their role has been proven controversial, and many ongoing trials have shown negative effects in treatment of spinal cord injury. Last three studies need randomized trials for its clinical application in spinal cord injury. So I thank you all, and I, I apologize for joining you guys late. And if I have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Zen. OK, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Simon. You go to the lecture, and uh, I have a question. Uh, in China, or some uh, some surgeon, uh, neurosurgeon, especially, they, they perform uh, some uh, decompression directly on the spinal cord. Because usually we perform decompression, we just perform the uh, we remove the lamina and we correct the fracture. But uh, we don't know what happened subdural, whether there is still high pressure there. <clears throat> um, to be a neurosurgeon, usually. For a, for a head trauma, we already decompress, we already open the door, we already remove all of the, we, uh, the, 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 the brain, we are part of the brain, we decompress the brain no pressure. But uh, we just know what happened subdural in the uh, spinal trauma. How do you think about this idea? 
I think uh, um, the idea is uh, it seems like it you know obviously uh, it entails in, in asking more questions than answers. Uh, the problem is that if if you have got a CT already available and doesn't show blood inside one, and if you if people who have got MRI, you can show there is no pressure there inside and no hemorrhage inside, then obviously opening up dura is not warranted. The other thing people have been doing is starting to pressure the uh, uh, the intraspinal pressure, measure, measuring that and see if the pressure is high. And then you think about, are we going to drain that just like in, in head injury? But I think, uh, again, those studies are very scarce at the moment and with no real evidence that really it works and we should do something or not. Um, Artem, you want to say something, please? Yes, uh, Salman, thank you for the great lecture. I, and I'll ask you, but I want to know your, your opinion. What do you think about uh, transplantation of uh, olfactorium uh, epithelium or in other cells to the system? Uh, of course, it's not emergency situation, but what's your general opinion regarding the transplantation for damaged cord? What do you think? I'm sorry, I, di I didn't get your uh, question again. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. I uh, the question regarding uh, olfactorium uh, and atelium cells, what do you think about transplantation in general? It's not emergency, of course. It's just a question of uh, of restoring of the function. What do you think? I think, you know, there have been uh, sporadic studies from all over the world showing that it does work. But unfortunately, no randomized control trial has been done. It's just like, you know, what we have been using with stem cell that you've, you know, a center doing stem cell therapy and then saying, okay, we have got these results, but unfortunately no randomized uh, studies. So really there is no evidence at the moment that all of these things that we are saying, um, that there's no class one or class two evidence. There's all the evidence is there is class three. So what we are saying is what I do is makes the patient better, um, then it's very difficult to follow that. So at the moment, evidence that we have from the literature does not show that. So we cannot put that in guidelines at the moment. So we can say that there is no, not enough evidence at the moment, for example, stem cell, for example, ralazole, for example, you know, granulocyte, et cetera, whatever we use. So all those things have been shown to improve in some way, but maybe those patients could have gone better anyway if they didn't get anything. So as we see that, you know, you see those, uh, those triggers that half of the patients with HIV are going to improve anyway uh, with good functional outcomes. So, and 3% of complete injuries. And we say, oh, like, you know, our medicine did it or they think did it. So we really don't know is the answer. So that's why we can't say that um, in guidelines that they work or they don't work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Okay, thank you, Dr. Simon. Thank you for your excellent lecture. And uh, our next speaker is uh, from India, uh, our Professor Sandeep. His topic is uh, the surgery, surgical management of cervical OPR. Please unmute yourself, Sandeep. Oh, okay, now it's fine. So, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, so I'll talk on cervical OPL and management. Uh, uh, Zan is also speaking on one part of it, so I won't speak on everything uh, regarding this. But uh, uh, OPLL, as you all know, is a hyperostatic condition that results in ectopic calcification of the PLL. And uh, earlier symptoms are tingling, numbness in the hands, gradually progressing to incoordination. And in some patients, there can be myelopathy. And in few patients that we see, they become with significant quadriparesis. They come on wheelchair with bladder bowel involved. And, uh, and sometimes this can happen suddenly after trauma. So these are the types of OPLL. These are seg uh, segmental, uh, continuous, and... Uh, so these are various types. I won't really discuss these in detail. This is continuous. This is segmental. This is a mixed variety. And uh, 
this is a localized where you can see the OPLL just behind the disc. Actually, it just looks like a disc prolapse, but when you remove the disc, you find that the PLL is calcified. So in radiology, we have to do X-ray neutral flexion and extension, CT of the cervical spine and the MRI. MRI is of utmost importance because that will tell you about the T2 changes or cord compression uh, and the number of levels that are involved. Well, in radiography, in CT scan, we can see the occupancy ratio, and a ratio of 30 to 60 percent is predictive of the development of myelopathy, and occupancy ratio more than 60 percent indicate there will be 100 percent chance to develop myelopathy. So these patients, even if they have minimum symptom, they should be operated. Again, K line is a line which is formed from the midpoint of C2 spinal canal to the midpoint of the spinal canal at C7. And a K-line positive patient will have OPLL anterior to this line and a K-line negative will have posterior to it. In a K-line positive patient, posterior approach is more suitable or can be easily performed while in K-line uh, negative and anterior approach is far more suitable because these patients are quite first. Similarly, effective load is a similar kind of line. Now, MRI, as I mentioned, it is a must to see the extent of calcification and then sink cord compression. Sometimes, uh, apart from the levels of the OPLL, you may see a disc prolapse at any other level also that you can tackle with at the same time. And T2 weighted images will demonstrate the cord changes which are associated with worse prognosis. And if they are there, we can counsel the patient accordingly. So management is uh, mostly surgical, but in some patients, there can be conservative management also. So it is limited to those patients who are accidentally diagnosed with OPL and have no significant symptoms. The MRI was done for some other thing and then you find it. Or patients presenting with mild symptoms like neck pain or radiculopathy, which can be managed with medicines. Uh, now, some patients who are diagnosed with minimum symptoms or who are accidentally diagnosed, though the surgery should not be the first choice in these patients, but they should still be counseled that in any accidental situation, there can be sudden worsening. So uh, they, they should be aware of these things uh, that they may require surgery in future, or if they want surgery can be performed at that time. So these are several studies which, uh, which showed that many of the patients uh, with OPLL may not progress to have symptoms. And in some studies, up to 70% patients did not have any symptoms. So again, this uh, and the complication rates after any major surgery in cervical spine would be at least 5% risk of other com various complications. So one should take the pros and cons of surgery in these patients, uh, particularly those patients who have minimum symptoms. The Shiba et al. analyzed 131 OPLL patients who underwent posterior decompression and reported 57% progression over two years. And it was more common in the case of continuous or mixed type of OPLL. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the preventive surgery is controversial because of the inherent risk, but as they can present acute neurological deficits with even minor cervical injury, and I actually see at least four or five patients like that every year who had a very minor trauma and uh, they become quadriplegic, and few become quadriplegic. And most of the patients who become co completely quadriplegic, they are on ventilator and most of them don't really survive. While those patients who come with acute deficits, uh, you can do surgery immediately to make them better. Now, the primary indication for surgery in patients with OPLL is progressive myelopathy, manifested by numbness, weakness of the upper extremities, spastic gait, or patients presenting in the setting of trauma and presenting with spinal cord injury, they are also surgical candidates for immediate surgery. Surgical approach can be decided upon the number of involved segments, degree of myelopathy, location of the pathology, whether anterior or posterior, and the number of levels uh, which are involved, the sagittal balance of the cervical spine and the experience of the surgeon. So it can be either anterior, posterior, or it can be a combined 360 degree surgery. So anterior versus posterior is a topic of perennial debate. Do there are certain guidelines based on K-line measurements, effective lordosis, occupancy ratio, but still many people continue to do what they prefer to do, whether anterior or posterior. I have seen that more of orthopedic, orthopedic surgeons more often do posterior procedures, while neurosurgeons may balance it according to uh, what is required for the patient. 
So now uh, this is a patient I operated recently. You see that there is a calcified segment behind C6, so a single level corpectomy sufficed here. The patient did well. While this patient has a focal OPLL with multi-level disc prolapse, so this is a short segment OPLL and can be tackled with anterior surgery. Perhaps this might be a candidate uh, where I may do a hybrid surgery that a corpectomy at one level and discectomy at one level. Uh, now, this is a type of focal OPLL, which is at three disc levels, and it can be done either anterior or posterior, depending on the surgeon's preference. Uh, both will do perfectly all right. Now, this was a patient we operated recently. Again, you see the, uh, the there's significant regeneration of the bone. And uh, in the x-ray, you can see that we could achieve uh, cervical lordosis on extension. So we decided to just to go posteriorly because we were worried that because of the poor bone quality, there can be implant failure. So we just did a laminectomy and lateral mass fixation in this patient. Now, uh, indications for anterior surgery are 60% or more of OPLL occupancy, a cervical kyphosis, and a sharp OPLL shape. Uh, a sharp OPLL shape is associated with a uh, high risk of neurological deficit and cord injury, so it is perhaps better tackled anteriorly. It will be difficult to go anteriorly if C2 and T1 levels are involved. Also, it becomes difficult if more than three levels are involved. So generally, in these patients, I tend to go posteriorly. No, now, there are certain problems associated with anterior surgery as compared to posterior surgery. There is a high risk of neurological injury, high risk of CSF leak, particularly where the dura is completely invested with the OPLL and uh, dysphagia and hoarseness, particularly elderly people. Again, that sometimes can be a debilitating issue postoperatively. And implant subsidence, uh, particularly in poor quality bone or in very old patients, and it may require a posterior stabilization to stabilize the spine. So advantages of anterior surgery are there is direct decompression of the pathology and there is better correction of kyphosis. So the, the various techniques in anterior surgery can be simple ACDF for uh, focal OPLL, then corpectomy infusion, which is the most commonly used technique, and a floating corpectomy when the dura is completely invested with the OPLL and then you, you are worried about uh, excising the dura, so you can leave a little bit of bone behind. And then ACF, which Zan is going to speak about later. And there can be hybrid surgery, which we are doing more often now uh, when in multi-segmental disease where you have to go anterior, then we may do corpectomy at one or two levels and then discectomy at other levels to increase the stability of the spine. And then skip corpectomy. Again, uh, in some cases, skip corpectomy can be done and it gives a better stability. So ACDF is normally done for segmental OPLL. Uh, like patient with continuous mixed OPLL will need a corpectomy infusion. And uh, this is, so as I said, in floating corpectomy, you, uh, you disconnect it from everywhere and then you can leave a very thin layer of uh, bone in the center. And so as not to damage the dura. But uh, I particularly don't really bother about that. I tend to remove everything, even if uh, I have to excise the dura, uh, because I have found that Repairing the dura is not a major issue. In all these patients, I put a hemo patch or a duragen and then supplement it with glue. We keep the patient on two days on lumbar drainage. And I have never seen a patient developing pseudomeningocele. So ACF, Zan is going to speak about it. And in posterior surgery, the, there are three approaches, laminectomy, laminoplasty, then laminectomy and lateral mass fixation and facet joint fusion, which was proposed by Atul Goyal, but has not found a uh, wide audience as of now. So I won't speak on that. Uh, so laminectomy alone is rarely done these days because of risk of developing kyphosis in the long run, while laminect laminectomy is usually supplemented by lateral mass fusion at involved levels. And laminectomy and fusion, in my hands at least, it takes less time and causes less blood loss than laminoplasty, but causes slightly more restriction in the range of movement. Uh, so this was a patient we operated uh, a few weeks ago. It was a 65-year-old male with progressive difficulty in walking, numbness and clumsiness in both hands. As you can see, there is a sort of continuous, uh, it's a mixed kind of picture, the OPL at some level and focal OPL at other levels. So disease is at four to five levels. 
So we did a laminectomy in lateral mass fixation. As you can see, there is some disease behind C2 also. So I don't really remove the C2 lamina. Sometimes I, because I don't want to strip off the muscles at C2 because it can lead to neck pain. So sometimes we undercut the C2 or if it is significant, then we do a hemilaminectomy at C2 level while laminectomy uh, below that. So I'll just show a short video of uh, lateral mass fixation. It's a very simple, straightforward technique and you don't need any CM or any special adjunct for it. You can just put your dissector in the facet joint to get the direction of the screw. And uh, you create an imaginary line uh, cross section on this uh, lateral mass. Uh, I normally start just medial and inferior to the middle point and go laterally. The literal trajectory, you can just guess by the idea that the, the drill is resting on this spinous process. So it is about 30 degrees literal. And, but just by resting it on this spinous process will give you a very good idea of the trajectory. So after drilling it for about a centimeter, then I use a drill, handle drill to take it to the desired length. And uh, then I tap it. And if there is any bleeding, you can immediately put in a screw to stop the bleeding. So the average screw length that I use is 16 to 18 millimeters, while in some patients I do even 20. Uh, I try to take a bicortical purchase in most of these patients. And it is important in particularly in small, small lateral masses or uh, uh, a weak bone with osteoporosis to get a bicortical purchase to get better strength. So you, you do the same procedure on the other side, you drill holes and then put in the screws. I'll just forward it a bit. So after all the screws are put in, I at least put a rod at least on one side uh, to stabilize the spine before I start decompression. <coughs> so you, you tighten the nuts. One person is holding onto the spine. Actually, it's not shown in the video because the hand was coming in. But normally, I keep a towel clip on the C2 spinous process and one person is lifting it up so as I don't cause any compression while drilling or tightening the screws. Uh, so once the construct is complete, then proceed for decompression. And this is the post-op x-ray of the patient. Now, coming to cervical laminoplasty, it can be open door or double door laminoplasty. Double door normally takes more time and posterior procedures have a higher rate of post-operative C5 root syndrome. And in various series, it ranges from five to 10%. Uh, in our series, we found that in the anterior procedure, uh, the C5 group syndrome uh, risk was three, between 3 and 4%, while in posterior, it was between 6 and 7%. Uh, this is a short video of an open door laminoplasty. So you drill uh, uh, it on one side. So normally, we drill it, uh, we lift it on this side where the patient has radiculopathy symptoms so that you can do a better foraminotomy on that side. So this patient had more symptoms on the uh, radical, radical symptoms on the left side. So we are lifting it towards the right side. So once you have, uh, so on this side, you cut it completely and then you just lift it. So once you have lifted it, we, we don't use any expensive implant. We just cut a 18 hole plate into three parts and then, uh, then just use these cut plates and you elevate the lamina and then fix it in that position so that it stays in that position. So there's a big gap between the lamina, uh, the two cut ends of the lamina now. So you fix it at every level like that. And if you don't elevate it and fix it like this, in that case, the, uh, the bone will fall back once you close the muscles. Uh, some people put in a graft in between. Uh, I generally don't put in a graft and it suffices. Uh, this is a patient who came to me where who had done a laminoplasty and actually worsened after laminoplasty. And if you see what the surgeon made the mistake was that he cut the lamina nicely, but then fixed it back in the same position without elevating it. So the compression continued. So we had, so then ultimately I removed all that and converted it into a laminectomy and lateral mass fixation. So when choosing the level of decompression, in addition to the segments affected with OPLL, one may consider decompression uh, above and below the affected levers to prevent spinal cord kinking at, uh, as the spinal cord drifts posteriorly once you have decompressed. That is more often for shorter level decompression. If you are doing four or five level decompression, then you really don't need to go extra. 
if if there is mild compression at the higher level, if you think that it may cause it, then we just undercut the upper and the lower lamina. Uh, and the indication for circumferential surgery would be limited. And example, my dear person, the significant kyphosis with the long segment disease, where we do a short segment anterior surgery or a hybrid surgery anteriorly and then supplement it with posterior fixation and laminectomy. Or if a uh, uh, patient has already been operated anteriorly and then uh, he has symptoms and then uh, it's, it may be challenging to go again anteriorly and in that case you can do posterior surgery. And in any patient having a three-level corpectomy or more, a posterior fixation also is recommended to provide increased stability because a three-level corpectomy may lead to instability of the uh, implant. Now, this is an example of circumferential surgery. This patient already had C4, 5, and C5, 6 fusions before, and he still had uh, significant compression. So we did a laminectomy and little mass fixation. This was a patient I saw recently, uh, perhaps it was an overkill. Like if you see here, the patient had a uh, significant disease between C4, 5, and 5, 6, perhaps a single level corpectomy or a limited uh, three level decompression from behind would have sufficed. But the surgeons somehow went overboard and fixed the patient from C2 to T1. And this patient actually developed quadripedic, uh, became significantly quadripedic. And he came to me six months after his surgery and he was still quadripedic. The MRI did not reveal any compression and there was nothing much that I could do for this patient. So one has to judiciously decide about the levels that one needs to operate. This was another patient who, who was operated twice before in the two different countries before the patient came to me. So, so previously patient had a two level discectomy after which a C6 bone collapsed. And another surgeon did a C6 corpectomy and fixed this implant. And now you can see everything is wrong with this implant. Uh, the, the kyphosis is not corrected. The cage is not properly resting on the vertebral body. The plate has got only one screw below. Uh, the, the plate is tilted and there's only one screw below, which is also going into the disc space. So this was a completely unstable implant. And uh, unfortunately, patient uh, developed weakness in both upper limbs, developed recurrent laryngeal paresis and significant dysphagia after the second surgery. So the, there was no point in going anteriorly. Uh, so we decided just to do a limited decompression from behind and just fix the spine. And patient did pretty well. Again, sometimes where you, you, you are in doubt whether to go anteriorly or posteriorly, ideally speaking in this patient, because there is a kyphotic spine, one should go anteriorly. But this was a 73-year-old female, severely spastic. But you could not even assess the power properly because she was so spastic. And But x-rays and extension showed a straightened spine. And she had a significant uh, difficulty breathing and her breath holding time was just 10, 15 seconds. So anesthetists were very wor worried about doing an anterior procedure. So, so we decided to go post uh, so we decided to go posteriorly. So you can see we have, though, though it is not a completely lordotic spine, but you can see there is a mild lordosis there. We were able to achieve a good decompression. And patient did quite well and could walk with support and spasticity reduced significantly after surgery. So again, this was a 71-year-old patient with bladder involved. And you can see there is a mildly kyphotic spine. And so, but he had past history of pulmonary tuberculosis, lung function was compromised, and he had already had a CABG done. So we decided to just do a quick surgery from behind. And now, coming to the complications, uh, there can be a cord injury, which could be the worst complication. Luckily, we have never seen that. A C5 root palsy are incidents that are mentioned in anterior surgeries between 3 to 4 percent, while in posterior surgery, it is uh, around 6 to 7 percent. I recently saw a patient, uh, I had operated him in, uh, I think, first week of April. A patient was fine after surgery. Actually, he was my friend and he was fine after surgery. Third day, he developed a C5 root palsy on the left hand. We started him on steroids. He completely improved in 48 hours and everybody was happy. Uh, and he remained all right for 10 days. 10 days later, he again developed a C5 root palsy, which was worse than before. And uh, this we started him on steroids again, which had been stopped before. And this time we continued for a couple of weeks. And then I saw him at the end of two months, that was about a couple of weeks ago. 
and his palsy had improved almost 90%. He, he, could, he was able to lift the hand uh, completely above and was able to lift five, up to 5 kg weight also. Another patient I saw recently who again had a very unusual uh, C5 root palsy after 15 days of surgery. So 15 days he was fine. He came for his suture removal after 10, 12 days. He was all right at the time. Then again, after three, four days, he came back uh, with C5 root palsy. And uh, it's been one month since then, and he's still not improved. So we are just waiting for that. And CSF leak, as I mentioned, I don't really worry too much about the CSF. I, I'm more worried about CSF leak in lumbar spine. But in cervical spine, I've never had any problem. We just keep the patient on a lumbar drainage for a couple of days and repair it with antiragin. I've never even seen a pseudomeningocele. Forget about CSF leak. And dysphagia and hoarseness is a common problem. Uh, dysphagia is a common problem, hoarseness not, but uh, yes, it can happen. And in few patients, dysphagia can take a few weeks to improve. And uh, so, so if you're doing a long segment surgery where you are going to apply it, uh, continuous pressure on the esophagus for a long time, then the recommendation is to release the pressure for some time in between. Then hardware failure or implant subsidence can be there in osteoporotic spine. And somehow you may have to go, if it was posterior, then you may have to supplement it anteriorly. Or if it was anterior surgery, then you have to go posteriorly to, uh, to support the spine. Occasionally, uh, I, these type of patients like uh, incomplete decompression leading to neurological sequelae, I see at least three, four patients like that every year who require a repeat surgery and blood loss and hematoma can be a very rare complication. So, so this was my own patient. Uh, he had c C452 level corpectomy and did well. His bones were not even osteoporotic. He came for a routine x-ray after three months, which showed that the graft subsidence. So we uh, we did a little mass fixation behind. <clears throat> so this was another patient. If you see that this is the pre-op MRI, you see that there is a kyphotic spine and multi-segmental OPLL. Uh, inexplicably, the surgeon just did a single level carpectomy and the rest of the compression was there. The patient became significantly quadriplegic after surgery, uh, perhaps because of the manipulation done while putting in the cage. Uh, the, the residual pressure impacted the spinal cord and injured it. And uh, so he came to us six months after his previous surgery and he was significantly quadriplegic. So this, this was the post-op MRI uh, and you can see a, there is compression at multiple levels. So we did a four level laminectomy and little mass fixation. Again, this was another patient who was a VIP patient and so he had this uh, C56 fusion done before. You can see even at the operated level, there are significant osteophytes which were not removed and actually he has got multi-segmental disease. So, so we did a two-level carpectomy here and then operated anteriorly. So to conclude, an initial trial with non-operative management should be attempted for patients without myelopathy or very mild symptoms. But most of the patients with myelopathy will need one or the other surgical procedures to decompress the spinal cord, and surgery is quite safe with relatively few complications. And most of the surgeons will still choose the approach they're more comfortable with, but uh, uh, one should be more objective in the approach that you are taking. Uh, if generally one to three levels are involved, then anterior surgery is more suitable. And if more than three levels are involved, then posterior decompression is indicated. Uh, whether laminectomy and fixation is done or laminoplasty is done, in most of the meta-analysis, the results are more or less the same. So, thank you. Excellent talk, uh, Sandeep. Really enjoyed that. I think uh, all the points that have to come out have come out. Well, how do you decide you're going to choose anterior or posterior approach, and which uh, one do you think has less complications with OPLR? I think posterior approach is more straightforward and definitely will have less complications. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll tell you that in my hands, uh, I have seen that C5 root syndrome is more common posteriorly and anteriorly also I've never faced any problem. So as I mentioned, if it's up to three levels, I go anteriorly. If it is more than three levels, I do posteriorly. If it is a redo, then I generally tend to go posteriorly. Yeah, like you know, in my hands, how I feel is that you know, whatever I can do anteriorly, I can give them more 
uh, like in fact better clinical outcomes than from the posterior where i'm yeah, doing because you're decompressing it directly then so i i'm inclined to go anterior in majority of the cases if i can uh, because i see clinical outcome is is clearly different yeah, even if it is more than three levels um I go up to four levels not beyond that so uh, if i have to go beyond three levels if i can do a hybrid procedure then i go beyond three levels but if so i i don't do three level corpectomies now i used to do that 20 years ago but i stopped doing that now so if i can do a two level corpectomy and a discectomy along with it then i do that otherwise i go posteriorly so most of the patients uh, then then more than three levels i do posterior okay so there are a couple of questions there harshad parak uh, is asking in your experience anterior surgery is quick and safe or posterior surgery and uh, uh, in cases of two level uh, as i said if it is two level and if its compression is anterior i will go anterior because uh, it is simple safe and then you are directly decompressing the spine okay riaz raja is asking um, uh, how should we deal with anterior osteophytes if they are attached to the dura i drill it out completely even if the dura comes out i don't leave anything behind because i am then i'm not sure whether i'm leaving any residual compression or not and as i mentioned i have never faced any problem even with csf leak intraoperatively because you can easily repair it yeah, i just did one 10 15 days ago and where the it was a two level corpectomy and the dura was involved for more than one uh, vertebral body segment so there were one square chunk of dura which was absent uh, once we took it out and we just put a hemo patch and there was no problem yeah sometimes i would leave an island of um, uh, you know, a thin rim of uh, osteophyte and it's a floating segment and doesn't cause any problems and we have uh, long term follow up so many people do that so it all depends how much it's stuck and what kind of outcome you want patients artem sorry you want to say something yeah i want to ask also thank you sandeep it nice lecture uh, finally, what kind of fusion you prefer for anterior uh, corporatomy? Is it all the transplants, any destructible device? What's what's your decision regarding it? So uh, I use an expandable cage with plate, uh, integrated plate with expandable cage. Or sometimes okay. I use a separate expandable cage and a plate. Okay. And, and in case if you decided to perform 360 degree decompression, do you use any uh, uh, neurophysiological tests uh, probably to to prove the necessity of uh, two sides decompression. I mean, if you perform posteriorly, then anterior, uh, any kind of uh, um, ne neurophysiological navigation or anything. Some so other some of the potentials, probably anything, yeah. So we don't do any electrophysiological tests. It is more clinical based. In very few patients, we will do both the procedures at the same time. Uh, in some patients where I think uh, the like I, if I've done anteriorly, I tell them that there may be a chance that if they don't get better, if there is any residual compression, then I may have to do go posteriorly because ultimately our uh, in our society, the patient has to pay for everything. So if I do both at the same time, uh, the cost will increase. So if I can just do one procedure, either anterior or posterior, the cost will be much less. So I tell them that there is a small chance that they may require it in future. But in those patients where we where there is significant kyphosis and it's a four four level disease, in that case we just do it at the same time. Like I, I may do a correction of kyphosis and decompression anteriorly and then do uh, posterior fixation. Okay, so there's a question that uh, isn't it difficult to repair dura anteriorly and how lumbar drain helps in cervical dura leaks? It is not difficult at all. I just. Uh, mm, lay a patch of uh, hemo patch <clears throat> and though the company recommends that you don't need a glue i still supplement it with glue and then put a lumbar drains to keep that area dry and that's it okay um i think we, uh, for me i think if we, if there is a dural um, deficit then i just use taco seal and it's much much more convenient and you know it doesn't give problems majority of people do that uh, Amit Shirmani wants to discuss a case. Uh, I think to your case, I'll ask Sandeep to reply personally because we cannot discuss individual cases here. Sorry. Um, and if anybody has any questions, otherwise you're going to move on to Artem. We can discuss later if there are any questions. And uh, Sandeep, would you mind please asking Amit Shirmani Shinwari his um, case? 
And Artem is going to tell us everything about MIS and how we do um, a, a cervical degenerative disc. Thank you, Salman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, dear colleagues, that I can participate in this nice presentation, nice webinar. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, actually, I want to share my experience in the minimal invasive uh, approach for the cervical degenerative spine. And due to Sandeep already uh, um, explained the choice of surgical approach, I'm going directly to the uh, algorithm we normally used for the spine degeneration. And we, as every, everywhere, um, can decide which kind of compression we have, soft or hard disc, costophytes. We will also measure the level of instability and uh, uh, existing of kyphosic. Then um, we try to analyze the situation with advanced level degeneration. Of course, we uh, check the, uh, the, the high and the axial location of uh, compression. And then we have existing choice of the surgical approach, anterior uh, uh, with uh, replacement of disc with uh, prosthesis. Uh, and then we often use the kind of posterior interlaminar approach, including endoscopic approach, which I try to practically to present with some uh, our uh, video uh, recordings. So uh, well-known um, presentation of the level of kyphotic, uh, lordotic uh, preservation of straightening of the spine, and several well-known 30 years uh, already methods which can be helped to surgeons decide if we have existing kyphosis or preservation of lordosis in current situation. And also according to Edward Benzel uh, description 20 years ago in spinal biomechanics, the existing situation with uh, uh, um, kyphotic deformation more than 70% of cases in the generation spine or preservation of lordosis or straightening, we can decide which kind of surgery we can perform. And as everywhere in, uh, let's say, um, 80, 75% of cases, in case of myelopathic patient who are doing corporectomy with uh, discectomy and fusion, but sometimes we can uh, also combine it with arthroplasty. It's only valid for the situation when we want to preserve the, um, the adjust levels. Um, here's the, uh, some video and uh, photo as we normally do in the anterior approach. Uh, in case of discotomy, we always uh, uh, introduce the, some kind of cages. Uh, in case of corporate, we will also combine the normally allograft with plate fixation. And uh, uh, last 10 years, we often use the prosthesis of cervical discs. It can be multi-level prosthesis. And also we try to measure the uh, um, deflection and degrees of lateral bending and prove that the uh, movements of the segments is quite sufficient. And the average um, average amount of movements is quite uh, uh, good enough. So at the same time, we can prove that the adjust level is not degenerate. That's most important because uh, before the uh, prosthetic era, we have about 10% of the patient which come in after 10 years or five years with uh, the adjust level degeneration and we have to perform surgery on the adjust level. So, also speaking a little bit about the posterior approach and in case of uh, lordosis is preserved, uh, uh, normally uh, the combination of uh, two uh, laminoplasty is available. It's uh, split laminoplasty Krakawa or uh, uh, open door laminoplasty here by Yashit. Some, some tricky things uh, I want to, to present. So the uh, the actual com comparison between the result of anterior approach in case of preservation of uh, kyphosis and uh, 
posterior approach for the laminoplasty, we compare the uh, results based on Japanese Orthopedic Association score and found that, that uh, the final result and the uh, um, recovery rate is nearly the equal, but it very depends, of course, of the uh, of the of the analysis rate. So if it's more than two years, it's of course thirty percent low rate um, um, recovery. But in case if it's uh, acute developing of the of the myelopathy, the results could be better. And we often use the neurophysiological test, including the magnetic uh, transcranial stimulation, with combination with evoked potentials to check which actually the compression is more severe, anterior, posterior, or combination. So um, the results is quite promising uh, based on the uh, immediate postoperative results of uh, Japanese Orthopedic Association and NURIC score. Um, the recovery rate in all cases of the compression for the anterior approach, corpoctomy and laminoplasty is nearly the same as about 43, 45% is still the same level, unfortunately, than it was uh, before. And uh, sometimes it's a little bit higher if we try to use the some neurophysiological navigation for uh, improving the results and make some target in the compression but it's still uh, uh, on the level of 50%. And of course, the results of uh, um, sufficiency of uh, posterior decompression, we are speaking about laminoplasty is based on the increasing of uh, transsectional area of uh, spinal canal. And we normally try to reach two times increasing of of sagittal diameter and uh, um, square area, area of, of uh, transsectional area. And uh, um, also what's noticeable, that's in case if we perform um, um, open door laminoplasty, we try also, also as, as, as was presented by Sandeep, we try to use the microplates to fix the, the part of the lamina which was uh, elevated. And it's it's quite uh, stable. It looks quite stable for the final um, range and um, control films. Um, sometimes we have uh, noticed that the migration of foramina can cause the after surgical uh, compression of radicular. So we always check the C5, C6 foramina because it's it's most narrowing. That's why especially special attention uh, is devoted to the this level because we always can check this level otherwise after elevation of lamina we can have the paresis c5 paresis and we had it uh, before we start to do this decompression on eight percent of cases and now we avoid this due to special attention it um, it, it's quite uh, quite attractive to use bone scalpel. It's ultrasound uh, device to perform the uh, incomplete uh, lesion, uh, incomplete incision of the lamina, and also uh, on the both sides and the uh, microplates. It's it's always uh, wide uh, used in practicing, and it's it's quite uh, suitable to use it for the end of laminoplastic cases. But finally, what's a uh, 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 most interesting point which I want to present, it's uh, endoscopic approach for the posterior spine. Uh, and we can use it in case of uh, soft uh, lateral, mostly herniation. Uh, as uh, everywhere, we start to do it uh, with microscope. But then later on, uh, after 10 probably years experience, we last five to seven years, we mostly use it with endoscope. We're doing portal navigation procedure. And if we have uh, monoradicular things, if we have uh, herniation, which located exactly under the interlaminar uh, space, we can perform this uh, portal or even last two years percutaneous endoscopic procedure to um, to remove this soft herniation. Uh, this actually techniques was uh, firstly uh, analyzed and uh, 
developing in lumber level. So we use the portal navigation for the lumber uh, herniation removing. And then using the same techniques and the same instruments, we start to use it, start to do it on the cervical spine. As I told, it's uh, very reliable and uh, good technology to use for the soft lateral disc, but not really uh, um, appropriate technology for the uh, osteophytes, as it can be, um, the, the, you, you always couldn't elevate the radicular uh, lateral or medial uh, in comparison with lumbar level as, as uh, in case of uh, severe moving, you can uh, provide a really serious neurological complication, radiculopathy and some kind of even uh, myelopathy. That's why we try to avoid uh, to perform this procedure in case of osteophytes. Uh, then uh, the procedure is combined with drilling of the adjunct laminas, and one third of facets also could be removed to uh, provide appropriate approach to the to the uh, uh, corner of the radiculus, which coming out from the dura. So this uh, um, techniques could be uh, available for the lateral soft. Uh, stable spine, uh, we recommend collar two weeks after the surgery. Uh, and we analyzed the results and uh, found that that's the, um, immediately after the surgery, we have reducing of complete removing of pain, uh, good uh, NDI, neck disability index uh, recover and other uh, social uh, recovering after the surgery. The endoscopic technology is quite understandable as it's the same as for um, open microscopic surgery. So it, it's a uh, view the head on the left, then legs on the right, uh, just detaching the muscles from the laminas on the level of border between facets and lamina. Then uh, to use high speed drill to remove a little uh, half of the uh, laminas to provide the um, approach into the exact underneath uh, corner of roof. Uh, <coughs> sorry. And we use carison also. It was combination with, uh, with the drill. Uh, just some question to avoid uh, severe bleeding as it uh, can be venous plexus quite uh, hypertrophic. Uh, then uh, it's it's somehow the question of palpation with the hook. You can attach attach detach the the radicula and to feel the soft herniation underneath. That's why it's not very easy to see sometimes. But after removing of yellow ligaments and uh, plexus, it could be seenable, and um, um, the attaching of the plexus can be reached by the uh, again the hooks or any other instruments. And the final twist in the hooks, you can remove the uh, soft herniation from behind the, the radicular and to to complete uh, um, decompress the, the this level. Uh, sometimes some use even the uh, kerosene and some uh, punch to to remove because it's it's uh, sometimes the combination between the soft and hard uh, um, components of the hernia, but anyway, it's always uh, after first uh, part removing of the soft uh, herniation, you uh, um, can manipulate much more easily on this level. Uh, the results is quite nice. Normally, the, as I told, the pain is disappearing immediately after the surgery. And uh, uh, last uh, couple of years, we start to use also the uh, uh, percutaneous decompression. It's not always the decompression exactly of the um, of the um, of the soft herniation but sometimes after a bony removing and the decompression of the of the radicula it's already enough to provide the uh, necessary um, necessary um, pain removing after after this kind of surgery and it's always also the working on the border between the facets and lamina and the exact decompression of radicular can be 
can be seenable and feenable uh, with the uh, hook. So uh, the um, soft herniation also can be removed in the same twisting maneuver as uh, for the portal navigation. But of course, uh, the uh, uh, bleeding, even small bleeding with constant irrigation, a little bit more challenging and can do some more problems with, with this way. So finally, um, as the conclusion, I should say that we try to to base our approach on the uh, neurophysiological and pathophysiological proof uh, uh, investigation, uh, try to preserve the compression and function, of course. We based our surgery on the minimal invasive principles to avoid damaging of soft tissue and muscular. Uh, the same, uh, the next day, um, normally the patient discharged from the hospital and it's somehow according to fast track tendency. So that's all from my side. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent uh, lecture, uh, Thank you. Professor Elton. Uh, and uh, I have a question. Uh, if you perform uh, also remove of the disc, so uh, how do how do you avoid the recurrence of the disc herniation? Usually, it's not like a furin. Yeah, so I was also going to ask the same question. <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, uh, after after five six years experience in the portal navigation, not in the in the case of irrigation with uh, percutaneous surgery, uh, I use the some uh, uh, cutting instruments and I can enter the disc now, and sometimes I controlling it with the with the range to see how how deep I am in disc. Uh, I I can even inspect it, not really inspect it with endoscope. But, but inspected with instruments. So finally, I can introduce even kerosene inside the disc from posterior and to cut a little bit osteophytes. So with the hook, I can check all the ventral part of, of the uh, dural sac and to avoid leaving any any parts of the soft herniation inside. So it's it's quite, it's not really seenable, but it's palp palpatable. So I can check if I couldn't uh, leave anything in there. That's why. Uh, Artem, like in lumbar disc, when you just remove the disc, there is a up to 5% risk of uh, recurrence. Uh, have you ever seen any recurrences in your posterior cervical discectomies? Sanip, you know, it's it's the question of uh, uh, the compression. Even, even if it's, there are some recurrence or even if I left something, <clears> because <throat> the compression was performed, the radicular is quite free. So uh, there is no pain recover, never. But if uh, to perform 100% control MRI, it could be some left uh, materials in there, but it's not a clinically, uh, any clinical um, problems after surgery. So, so you mean to say that the clinical recurrence uh, rate is 0%? Not really zero, but I would say that uh, pain relief is 95%, complete, 5% and some rest pain with uh, reducing of intensity, of course. No, but how many patients would require a repeat surgery for, for uh, the same? Not, not the same approach. We have repeated surgery after more than one year due to instability only. No, what I'm asking is like when you do an anterior cervical discectomy, you remove the disc completely. So the risk of recurrence and reoperation for the same is practically zero until there is an implant failure or something. But here, like lumbar disc, if uh, there, there is a recurrence, then you may need to reoperate it by the same or any other approach. Yeah, you're right, Sandeep. But if you if you perform anterior disc uh, uh, surgery, you have 10% of advanced disc degeneration and 10% uh, problem with the next disc. In case of posterior approach, you couldn't damage the advanced level and have maximum 5% of recovery. So it's anyway, it's feasible. No, for I that, think, uh, basically for that purpose only, I use artificial disc now in most of the discectomies in younger people. Yeah, but you know that 30% of artificial disc work as the expensive cage only. It doesn't work as the disc. That's in what. the long run, but in uh, I have I have seen patients up to 10 years and the disc 
still seems to be functioning in many of them. Yes, I also, but any, anyway, it, it's statistic. 25-30% of artificial disk doesn't work as disk, as the as the prosthesis, I mean. I think Artem so. is right from that perspective, but at the same time, I think uh, the entire uh, approach is time-tested. Uh, and we know as long as we are careful with the, how we perform it, do not uh, damage the adjacent level, do not go beyond the adjacent level, just stick to that level. I think the results are pretty good. The, the you know 25 years follow up is there for many series, and they've shown pretty good results. And the biggest advantage is no pain if you're going anteriorly, whereas posteriorly, uh, pain is a is a is a factor that comes into play. But obviously there are goods and bads, and I think very the very good presentation and and very very nice uh, technique that you showed. Uh, very Thank impressive. You. But, so but have... just last remarks. Uh, you, you understood that the patient who wants to have endoscopic removing only hernia because disc removing is somehow make uh, uh, some practicing problem for the patient. And if just uh, you promise that only disc will be removed, it's much more attractive, you know. Yeah, you tell them you remove the pain. Don't yeah. say it's, it's no. disc or anything else. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to move on. Uh, our, uh, we have another brilliant talk. Uh, Zen Chen is going to tell us all about uh, what's new in uh, anterior surgery. Okay, <clears throat> good evening, all colleagues. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk about a new technique that's called the ACAF, Anterior Controllable Antidisipatement, and fewer is a complex name. Uh, this technique just uh, for cervical OPL, and uh, I have nothing to discuss. Cervical OPL is very high incidence in uh, East Asia area, <clears throat> so we have to solve this problem by ourselves. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, Japanese South Korea and uh, Chinese uh, surgeons uh, do a lot of research and uh, try uh, all kinds of technique for this kind of uh, Patient, uh, we can we can use the anterior approach, just uh, ACDF or ACCF for, for uh, short segments uh, <clears throat> clearance, and uh, we can also use uh, uh, laminar plasty or decompression fusion from posterior approach, and uh, for very long, more than segment or three segments uh, clearance. And uh, sometimes uh, we we should use uh, anterior and uh, posterior combined approach for some uh, complicated cases. Um, but uh, each of these technique have their shortcomings. For anterior approach, <clears throat> just what was uh, uh, Doctor Sandeep have uh, said that uh, we have face the CS bleak and uh, sometimes uh, if for, for long multi level anterior approach. Uh, it's uh, very uh, hard to keep the keep the spine stable, and uh, for posterior approach, uh, there is uh, axial pain, C5 palsy, and a lot of shortcomings for these traditional uh, approaches. And uh, we have a very complex strategy for cervical OPL, and it depends on how how, how many levels. And for the levels at less than three levels, we may choose anterior approach. And if the levels is more than three, maybe posterior approach should be used. And also K line is very important to judge with whether which kind of approach we should use. But even with all of these techniques and this complex strategy, there is a, there is a, <clears throat> Uh, always some uh, very difficult case we have no idea how to treat so that such kind of this case uh, of very long uh, appeal areas more than three segments and uh, the key line is negative it means that uh, it's uh, not uh, suitable for positive approach um, but uh, for anterior approach uh, it's uh, segments uh, is too much so for those kind of patients, uh, it's still a very, very difficult case. In 2008, a new technique was reported by Chinese surgeons, and it's called the ACAF. Uh, this technique is very new, uh, relative, uh, rather new. It's uh, just use anterior approach, but uh, with, uh, with this technique, we need not to 
remove the OPL lesion. We just pull the OPL lesion anteriorly and then uh, with the pull, uh, the lesions anteriorly, we can enlarge the spinal canal, uh, the, the cervical spinal canal. So <clears throat> uh, it's avoid the shortcomings uh, with uh, uh, of anterior uh, approach that uh, uh, we can avoid the CSF leak. And uh, we also preserved all of the posterior structures and the muscles. So the shortcomings of posterior approach are also avoided. Uh, and also, uh, an, a study with this uh, technique showed that uh, with the uh, anterior enlarged the spinal canal, the spinal cord are decompressed naturally, uh, just in situ. Does not like a posterior approach decompression, uh, the spinal cord will drift posteriorly. And uh, so the spinal cord are decompressed more, more uh, appropriately. And uh, the, uh, a lot of complications with the post approach are avoided, <clears throat> such as uh, exopia and uh, C5 palsy. Another study shows that with this technique, we can solve all of the, all of the problem, whether the OPR lesion is thick, uh, more than six millimeter or less than six millimeter, uh, whether the K-line is positive or negative, whether the occupation ratio is 60% uh, or more than 30%. The result of the operation are also good. So with this study, uh, we think that with this technique can totally uh, change the traditional uh, surgery strategy of cervical OPL. Uh, from 2019, we use this technique for our patient. And uh, till this year, we have uh, performed uh, 55 cases. And uh, we get a very excellent result. Uh, the GOA score was, uh, the GOA score improvement was uh, uh, 35% in average. But uh, there's still the, some uh, complications. Uh, we injured uh, the vertebral artery in one case, and uh, the CS leak was happened in three cases. And in six cases, the vertebral artery uh, was not left enough. And uh, in one case, we performed the posterior approach, posterior pro decompression in the second stage. And there is uh, some uh, technological uh, difficulty uh, in this technique. Uh, for we have to cut open the vertebral body on bilateral side, but the OPL lesion are always not are always irregular. For this for this patient, if the if the <clears throat> OPL lesion are are uh, spreaded to lateral side, uh, when we cut the vertebral body on this side, we have to cut open the OPL lesion. Uh, it's a uh, have a high incidence to open the dura, and uh, for this for this patient, the OPL OPL lesion are located on one side. Uh, so when we cut on this on this side of vertebral body, we have to cut open the OPL lesion. It's uh, a little dangerous, and also we have to avoid the injury of vertebral artery. Especially when the vertebral artery are not uh, are not the same on bilateral side. Sometimes, if for the dominant side, uh, vertebral artery is injured, uh, it will a disaster complication will be happened. Uh, in two thousand twenty, we published our operation video in uh, Neurosurgery Focus to introduce this. Uh, technique. This is a video. Uh, 
Oh, uh, sorry, I can't have an open, I cannot play the video. Okay. Uh, so I, I'll give you some uh, example case. Uh, this is a patient, uh, 37 years old, <clears throat> male. He suffered uh, weakness uh, um, uh, for extremities. And the uh, MRI showed uh, very uh, stenosis of a cervical spinal canal. And uh, uh, CT showed that there is an uh, OPR region in the positive border of the cervical spine. And then we performed the ACF for this patient. We pulled the uh, uh, three vertebral body anteriorly, and uh, we can see the <clears throat> spinal canal are enlarged, and the spinal cord are decompressed. Uh, this is uh, another case, a very difficult case. Uh, she is a female, 49 years old. He suffered uh, weakness uh, of four extremities for 10 days. On admitted to our hospital, his uh, muscle strength on is a three grade in upper extremities and one grade in lower extremities, almost paralyzed. So we performed a CT scan and MRI for the patient. We found a very uh, huge uh, cervical OPR lesion from C3 to C7, a very long OPR lesion. And, uh, Exoview, we can see this uh, area is very large, uh, compressed, uh, this, and uh, the op occupation reach ratio is more than 60%. Uh, MRI showed that the spinal cord, spinal cord are decompressed, uh, are uh, compressed very severely. Exoview, also the spinal canal are compressed. So I performed the emergent. Uh, <clears throat> Surgery for this patient. Um, for this patient, uh, I have to pull uh, four uh, cervical spine, spine anteriorly. But uh, the longest uh, plate for us is only is not uh, long enough. So I combined a small, a short uh, plate uh, on in the anterior side, and uh, we pulled this uh, four uh, vertebral body. Anteriorly, so the result uh, <coughs> is good. The uh, spinal canal are decompressed. On X view, we can see the spinal canal are decompressed. Good. And uh, three months later, the patient recovered uh, very well with no neurological deficit. Uh, so this uh, technique is very. <coughs> uh, is very uh, useful for a cervical OPL. Now, and uh, I, we write a letter, a capture in our book, uh, edit, edited by, um, by our WFNS committee. And uh, also we, we joined uh, a <clears throat> uh, randomized multi-center study to combine the, uh, to to judge, uh, to evaluate anterior uh, ACF and uh, uh, posterior lamina plastic. Uh, it's the, this study is called the STAR. Uh, in this study, we just uh, randomized, uh, divided the patient into two groups, and uh, one group is for ACF, and another group, for, another group is posterior lamina plastic. We called it the STAR. Study. And uh, I think uh, the study will be finished this year. And uh, I, I think uh, with the result, we can give a uh, uh, revolutionary change of our traditional st strategy for OPR. So when we have a OPR, so we call OPR patient, we do not need to choose anterior, posterior, our combined approach. We just use ACF to solve this problem. Thank you. And I think wonderful talk. Um, and there's a question that what do you do with the disc in between when you take out uh, on each side the 
you you make those shelves on both sides to open up and move the whole thing forward. So what what about the disk in between? How do you tackle that? We remove uh, every disk uh, in the segments. We we pull them. We pull the we pull them up. John, uh, one question, and uh, uh, what's with the uh, general uh, movement in the neck? Uh, is this patient is uh, couldn't uh, be uh, the same movements as before the surgery, uh, or how they uh, limited of the movements in the neck after such long uh, anterior fixation, late fixation? Yeah, it's an anterior fixation and fusion technique, so the movement of the segments will uh, disappear. But uh, this kind of patient, uh, because a long, a long uh, multi-level OPL, the movement of this spine are also uh, decreased. So the question is, what about when you're doing all these long segments anteriorly? Um, what difficulties do you face, and how do you, uh, you know, come up to those expectations or challenges? Uh, uh, as you know, this technique is very difficult. So. Uh, we have to cut open every vertebral body on bilateral side. Uh, and uh, then we can pull, pull this uh, vertebral body anteriorly. So when we perform this uh, technique, when this technique was uh, reported, a lot of uh, osteopathic surgeons think it's impossible. It's, uh, it's uh, too dangerous. Why not we just uh, perform laminoplasty? It's, uh, it's uh, easy. It's uh, quick and solve the problem. Why we should face so much danger to perform this operation, to do this operation? Um, but, uh, you know, when we, we neurosurgeon from this technique, we love it. We use a microscope to perform the cutting by, on the left side of the water body. It's uh, not so dangerous for us. So this technique was uh, first uh, uh, were accepted by a lot of neurosurgeons. And uh, so uh, we, we do a lot of this uh, technique for a patient. How can we reduce the risk of uh, CSF leak, for example, or um, um, uh, damage to the artery? Is this, is this uh, assessing the whole thing beforehand that is it safe to do this? And which cases would you feel that no, we shouldn't do this? We should do maybe a posterior approach. Mm, first, the water artery. Uh, we no, we you already perform CT CT angiography before operation to judge why which oh mm, which side <clears throat> is dangerous uh, for to to hurt the water artery. Usually, it uh, can be avoid or avoid. Uh, the, the other thing is the dual open, <clears throat> it's a CS bleak. Um, you some we have three cases, uh, the because the OPR lesion is too on, on one side. When we cut, uh, when we drill open the vertebral body, uh, we tear tear the dura and the CS bleak. But uh, this CS bleak is easy to treat because only a very small hole. On the bureau, when we when we put a number drainage and uh, uh, usually five days or seven days, and the <clears throat> cell leak can be cured. It's not like uh, when we perform uh, ACF. When we perform ACF, if the dura is attached, uh, 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 attached to the OPL region, a lot uh, a lot of uh, Dura will disappear, and uh, the sometimes uh, that kind of uh, dura t dura uh, defect is hard to cure. Okay, and um, if what would be the ideal case that you would like to start this? If somebody wants to start, which which would be an ideal case to do to ensure <laughs> that you don't cause any problems? Maybe two one level, two level, no more than three levels. It's, okay. uh, it's easy to perform this technique. Okay, and so there's a question from uh, Dr. Harshad Parekh, and he's asking how you find advantages of your technique over other approaches like anterior ACDF or anterior corpaculins. 
what is the advantage you have like is do you think you're going to make a difference if you do this compared to what people are doing at the moment mm, i think uh 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 compare compare this technique with other uh, anterior portion technique uh, i think the most important is uh, uh we can avoid the tear tear of the tear open of the dual and uh, because uh, uh, before we use this technique a lot of cases we we will uh, we will have CS leak in our patient but uh, when we use this kind of technique we can uh, cure very complicated cases with no complications Okay, so you feel that people who don't have that kind of CSF leak, they don't need to do this procedure and they should be doing, continue doing what you're doing because obviously their CSF leak rates are not high. So they're okay to uh, carry on with what they're doing. Yes, from, uh, uh, from the images, uh, CT scan, we can evaluate whether there is a high incidence of CSF leak or there is a more low incidence of CSF leak. Therefore, there is no dangerous of self leak. We just perform ACCF for the patient. And is there a learning curve with it? Is there a learning curve? Does it take time to get? Yeah, there is a it? very very sharp learning curve for this patient uh, cases. Um, our colleague uh, have read a, have a, a article, and uh, in this in that article, they analyzed that, uh, and then they. Concluded that at least, uh, at least we have performed twenty nine cases. After this can, this, this, um, after twenty nine cases, uh, the doctor can 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 perform this technique very uh, nicely. Okay, brilliant. Um, any more questions? Any long term follow ups? There's a question from Ming Yang. Do you have any long-term follow-up at the moment, Zhenzhen? Oh, yeah. Uh, the longest follow-up uh, is more than uh, five, uh, five years uh, by our orthopedic surgeons. And uh, the result uh, is, uh, is very well, is very good. All right, good. Um, uh, Sandeep, do you have any question or shall we move on to uh, our case discussions? No, no, you can move on to case discussions. Zanjan, it was an excellent talk. I tried to do it once, but I found it too challenging just to create those uh, gutters in the vertebral body. I, I went back to my original corpectomy then. So, so heads off to you that you can do such complicated surgeries. So hopefully yeah, you, yeah. I, I have go to on. log off. Sorry, I have to go somewhere. So I will log off. So uh, excuse me. Take care, Sandeep. Okay. Thank you for your talk and uh, presence. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Zhenchen, would you like to introduce the next speakers? Okay. I'm like, uh, uh, Professor Guan is a uh, uh, doctor in, in our team. And Professor Guan and Professor Duan are our, uh, our <clears throat> vice professors in our team. And uh, they do a lot of uh, this kind of uh, operations. Please. Okay. Uh, good evening, professors. Uh, I'm Dr. Guan Zhen from Xiongwu Hospital. Uh, it's my great honor to attend this meeting and to share my case of OPIL. Uh, this is a male patient, 42 years old. Uh, he suffered from numbness in both hands with ASPO working for two years and aggravated for more than six months. Uh, the physical examination is the area of the hand numbness. And the muscle strength of the upper limbs is almost normal. The muscle strength of the lower limbs is almost normal too. 
and the, ref the reflection of the lower limbs is high, and the Babinskian side and the Hoffman side of bilateral side is positive. The Y score is zero, and the cervical zero A score is ten. This the preoperative X-ray, the lateral view, and the AP view. This the hyperflexion and the hyperextension position, and the double oblique view. The preoperative MRT2 weighted imaging, the such view we can see a serial spinal decomposition in C3, C4, and C5 level, uh, especially in the right side. This is the MRX view in the C3 to C4 level. We can see the spinal cord is compressed. And the X view in C4 to C5 level, we can see the compression uh, is more severe in the right side. And this is the X view in the C4 to C6 level. The 3D CT such the view, we can see a uh, OPRL in behind the, the C3, C4, and C5 level. And the OPRL is part fusion with the uh, positive part of the vertebral body. The axial view in C3 to C4 level, we can see the base of the OPRL is white and the transverse foramen of the right side is large. This diaxial in the C4 to C5 level, we can see the compression is severe and the, the OPR almost reached the positive wall of the spinal canal. This is the axial in C5 to C6 level. Uh, the preoperative CTA, we can see uh, the vertebral artery of the right side is the predominant vertebral artery. Uh, and the, the occupation ratio uh, is almost uh, 76%. Uh, the K line is positive. Uh, the diagnosis uh, is OPRL uh, in C, C3 to C5 level. And for this patient, uh, we perform a surgery of ACAF. Uh, for the traditional uh, ACAF surgery, uh, uh, at least the three vertebrae will be anti-placed to achieve a sufficient decompression. Uh, but for this patient, uh, we design a nerve type technique. Uh, because the OPIL is fusion with the, the vertebral body of C4, uh, so uh, we remove part of the uh, positive part of the uh, C, C3 vertebral body uh, to accommodate the OPIL. So then we can. Uh, anti placed only two multiple, multiple uh, the C4 and the C5 uh, to reduce a uh, segment of fusion. Uh, the key point of this surgery uh, first, uh, we must uh, make sure there is a sufficient uh, uh, space uh, to accommodate the OPRL. And uh, then, uh, because the right that vertebral artery is the predominant and the transverse foramen is large. So uh, the ostomy in the right side must be in the precise location uh, to avoid the uh, injury to the vertebral artery. Uh, let us see the video of the operation. Uh, first, uh, we perform Disectomy in C4 to 5 and 5 to 6 level. Then we remove 
the part of the bone of the C4, C4 and C5. Then we perform disectomy in C3 to C5 level. Then we remove the posterior part of the C3 vertebra. Uh, after we strip the bone of the posterior wall of C3, we can see the OPL. We probe the posterior wall of the lateral vertebra to make sure no obstacle to the anti-placement of the OPIL. Then we remove the posterior part of C3 up to the C2 to C3 disc. Then we put case uh, in C3 to C4 level. After plate is fixed, the arteriostomy was performed in bilateral Lucica joint. Uh, this is the left side. Then the anti placement was performed. At uh, least the post operative 3D CT. Uh, we can see uh, the C, C4 and C5 vertebral was anti placed and the spinal canal is enlarged. The axial wheel, we can see part of the C3 vertebral is removed to accommodate the OPIL. And uh, this axial wheel of C4 level, we can see the osteotomies in bilateral lucica joint. And it's very close to the transverse foramen of the right side. This axial in C5 level. And the post-operative MR such to view, uh, we can see the Spinal cord is decompressed. List the axial in the C3 to C4 level, C4 to 5 level, and 5 to 6 level. We can see the decompression is very sufficient. List the post operative x ray, the lateral view, and the AP view. We can see uh, the plate and the screw are in the process location. The patient feels less numbness than before the surgery and has more strength. Thank you. Yeah, and John, I think an excellent case. I think you showed very well how to do it right. Clearly, I think technical skills is required and, and inspection of the uh, arteries, how they are behaving. Um, the, um, uh, the osteophyte, where exactly it's going. And if there is attachment uh, of osteophyte to the dura, all that comes into play when you're doing this. But I think an excellent case to do this. Um, Artem, any questions from you? Uh, I was wondering how it's possible to remove the osteophytes. Uh, and uh, yeah, not really questions, but I'll try. But uh, yeah, for my opinion, it's only the question that the limiting of movements of the fixed segments can uh, provide uh, instability and degeneration of adjust levels. That's why this patient is candidates for the, uh, for the degeneration of the lower levels yeah, in the nearest couple of years. That's, that's the question. I think if, if obviously they are just moving it anteriorly and fixing it, so it's going to remain stable otherwise. So And the joints are intact on both sides. So I don't think the question of stability would come into play. If you're going to do anterior fixation, I think same kind of risk will apply. So I don't think we're going to increase the risk by just doing the ACF procedure. It's the only thing is that 
technically it's de it's uh, demanding and at the same time you need to study the scans very carefully and select the right patients okay shall we go on to the next uh, uh, case please Uh, Professor Duan is also a uh, first <clears throat> professor in our uh, department, and uh, he also performs the same, a lot of uh, complex cervical uh, surgeries. Please. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. It is my honor to attend this meeting. And today I will talk about a case uh, we performed using the ACF technique. Uh, this is a 79-year-old male. He suffered from numbness and weakness in the right hand for 25 years and aggravated with muscle, uh, muscle uh, atrophy for one year. And the numbness area expanded to the whole right arm and leg. He underwent uh, anterior cervical uh, disectomy and furin 25 years ago and posterior cervical uh, spinal canal decompression uh, nine months ago, but the uh, symptom uh, still get worse. For the uh, physical examination, the motor uh, abnormal uh, symptom include the uh, uh, right upper proximal mu uh, muscle strength is four gray and right upper uh, distal three and right lower and lower uh, uh, proximal and distal are uh, full. And uh, for the sensation, uh, the light touch and the pin peak are abnormal and the reflex, uh, deep tendon reflex is hyper reflexible. And the right Babinski sign is positive and Hoffman sign in the right is positive. And uh, here is the form. And the JOA score is seven. Here is the X-ray uh, indicates the uh, prior operation. Uh, he underwent uh, the, the intervertebral furin uh, go from anterior uh, uh, is located in the C four to five and five to six. Here is the uh, CT scan. Uh, we can see that there is a slight uh, kyphosis in the uh, cervical. And the, the C4, 5, and 6 has been uh, fused, and the P line is negative. And there is a severe uh, stenosis in the cervical canal. And the OPL type is continuous. And also <clears throat> the occupying ratio is 75%. And the base of the uh, OPL is, is wide. And uh, there are uh, about two to three millimeter uh, in, wide, in width. Uh, in the bilateral uh, for us to make the, <clears throat> make the curve uh, to perform the ACAF. And also from the CTA, we can identify the uh, predominant side is in the, in the, uh, is in the left. And there is not uh, obvious abnormal causing of the vertebral artery. Here is a MRI, we can see the spinal cord has been compressed seriously. There are uh, abnormal uh, intensity in the T2 weighted image. And the uh, transverse view, we can see the severe uh, compression to the spinal cord in the CD45 and 5 to 6. So the diagnosis, uh, cervical 
myelopathy and the spinal stenosis and OBL and cervical kyphosis. So for for this patient, there is we met some difficulty in treating this patient because there uh, he has no one two prior operations. Uh, one is anterior cervical discectomy and furin, and the uh, the planted cage has been uh, fused with the bones, so it is very difficult to uh, perform the decompression from anterior. And also he has underwent another surgery from posterior uh, less than one year ago. And, and the posterior operation didn't bring him uh, some benefits. So for this patient, we chose the ACF uh, surgery. Here is the uh, uh, video. We decided to uh, to perform the ACF of C three to four, and we will uh, we will also do the ACF uh, to the C uh, six to seven, and then we leave alone the four to five and five to six, and then we will. Uh, lift uh, the C3 to uh, 7 as a whole uh, forward. So this is how we did the complete ACDF of C3 to 4 and 6 to 7 level. So we uh, use a high speed drill to move into the uh, the ligaments. And then we do the, uh, we drill the, uh, uh, the curve in the left, uh, firstly. This is a two millimeter uh, uh, high speed uh, drill. And also we, made a very thin uh, section to make our view very clear. And also we uh, put some uh, bone bars to make it, make it uh, more easy to fill in. After we perform the uh, drill in the left, we uh, put the uh, plate and also we leave some uh, space between the bones and the plate. And then we, uh, we drill in the right side. When we drill, it is very important to identify the uh, direction because under the uh, microscope, sometimes uh, we may miss the direction so that the drill is not uh, direct. Is not direct. That will uh, that uh, may leave some OPIR. Uh, in the in the in the left, and under the microscope, we can identify we have uh, successfully uh, make the curve, and then we will uh, perform the sorry. And then we will leave the C3 to C7 as a whole uh, forward. So here is the uh, image after the surgery. Uh, you can see the kyphosis has been corrected. And the, 
and the OPR and the phone as a whole has been lifted uh, to the front. And the K-line has come to a positive and the uh, spinal canal has been uh, has been uh, get wider. So here is an image comparison before and post the operation. You can see the OPIL has been uh, anti-placed anti -placed forward. And from the MRI, we can see the spinal cord has been decompressed uh, very successfully. And the symptom of the patient has uh, get better very uh, quick. And only three days post operation, the numbness and weakness in the right extremity relieved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think another excellent um, uh, case. Really enjoyed that, uh, especially with kyphosis. I thought it'd be very difficult to correct that, and it looks like that. But I think posteriorly there is some kyphosis, but anteriorly I think you've corrected it very well. Um, good case. Uh, any uh, suggestion? Any comments? Adar Rahimi, you are there. Would you like to have any comments? May I? Uh, so, uh, yeah, yep. I, I just, I just uh, think it, that's, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's a nice correction of kyphosis, but not complete removing of anterior osteophytes. I mean, uh, could it be, for my opinion, possible to perform posterior decompression with uh, screw fixation? It would be easier, for my opinion. But uh, yes, of course, the results uh, could uh, looks quite nice. But for, for me, it's more understandable to perform posterior surgery, of course, in this way. But anyway, it, it's a nice uh, example. Thank you, Professor Chan. It's, it's, it's interesting. Manuel, would you like to uh, say something? Manuel Soto, one of our members from Mexico, is here. Just unmute yourself. I think some, there's some lightning going on with Manuel. So I don't know. Then, Chen, your comments on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, OPR, so-called OPR is very special kind of disease. Uh, the, the posterior border of the several vertebral body are fused together. So it's very, it's very suitable for this kind of quick case. We just pull it up as a whole one. And uh, it's easy to, it's uh, reasonable to treat with this technique. And I also tried to use this technique to treat some uh, degenerative uh, cervical spinal uh, cervical spinal stenosis without uh, very severe OPR lesions. It's not so the result is not so good. For sometimes um, it's, it's, it's a flap of the water body are not uh, so 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 easy as what we do uh, in OPR cases. So. I think uh, this technique kind of is most suitable for OPR cases, but uh, even though uh, the OPR cases is um, more, more, most uh, happened in East Asia area. And uh, uh, when I see other people say OPR cases, sometimes uh, they're not OPR cases, just uh, uh, degenerative state, uh, as noses. So uh, uh, I think uh, we should not use this technique to treat a degenerative stenosis. Okay. The other uh, thing which could be concerned Um, the, the other thing that uh, could be a concern if the, there is an uh, OPLL that's going underneath and it has got sharp angles and the dura is stuck there. And when you're trying to pull it um, uh, anteriorly, obviously, you, you know, you could cause problems neurologically as well as dural tear. Have you seen that? No. Uh, every CF leak 
in our in our series, and uh, it's all uh, the uh, happened when we cut the gotcha. from the roof and we cut it directly cut the door open. There is no case some cases when we pull the the what about no deterioration in neurology. You did not see any patient with worsening neurology. No, there's no neural nerve formation and there's Very no parts of the no. I think excellent cases. Hopefully, uh, we can have you over here sometime and you could show us how you do it. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Let's see if there's anything on the chat. Everybody seems to be ha with happy with what you're doing, uh, Zen Chen and Atom. I think, I think great webinar, really enjoyed it. Uh, and to all our Chinese friends who joined in Chinese, we are grateful to them. Zen Chen, uh, really um, very good organization. Very happy with it. Okay, thank you. Artem, your comments? Yes, I think, I think we uh, actually going, uh, you know, the history of spinal neck surgery, especially, is going to spiral, yeah? And we start from posterior, then going to anterior mostly. Now, then we're going to laminoplastic surgery from posterior. Now it's again another level when our Chinese colleagues, due to very high, high accidents of OPLL surgery, present very interesting techniques from anterior, which I'm actually also the fan of anterior surgery for this for the cervical spine, doing probably now 50-50 from posterior, but it's it's always the a lot of new possibilities to to make our surgery excellence. And uh, that's that's really interesting technologies and very nice presentations, everything. Thank you. Thank you, Zanshan. It's it's really interesting. Okay, can you have a group photograph? Can everybody switch on their videos, please? So we can have a group photograph. Uh, Imad, could you kindly take the picture, please? Yes, sir. Wonderful smile, Miguel. <laughs> Please switch on your videos, please, everybody. Nicholas, you forgot your T-shirt. Okay. Wonderful. Ready? Thank you. Amad, are you done? Yes, sir. Smile, smile, everybody, smile. We all can smile, it's fine. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Zen Chen. Thank you, everybody who participated and uh, made this a great event. We'll see you in a few weeks with, uh, in fact, next week with another uh, session. Um, and hopefully we, we'll have more fun. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.